um, colleague of Shannon Tuck from the School of Government. Um, and they asked me to come talk about public records. What I did, and some of you may, if you have an electronic device, you can download them. Um, I sent them some case problems for you guys to work on. Um, anybody have those? Anybody have access to their electronic devices of some kind? Okay. Well, that's not going to work. Pardon? Um, is there a website for the, for the program? My understanding was they were going to be posted for you all that have access to it. They haven't shared that. I heard that there was an app. Okay, the app is not scheduled. It's not in there. Okay, then. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Since we're a small group, I will tell you what they are, and we can talk about them. Um, I was going to give, there were two things that I gave them to, to give you. One was um, the case problems, and the other is a, an overview of public records law. And I'll make sure that they email that out or somehow get that to you, because that's the background information. And it's really for your benefit, um, just as a resource. Um, but the other thing is, these case problems are involve situations that I hear about from IT folks and from cities and counties and schools in North Carolina. And so I thought we would use them to talk. But also, if you have questions or situations that you face uh, involving public records that you're particularly interested in, um, happy to talk about those. So at the School of Government, um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer and I teach um, basic general local government law to uh, a lot of folks and I also work in particular in the area of public records and other meetings. So this is an area I spend a lot of time trying to answer questions in. Um, and so since you've been brave enough to stay late in the afternoon and there's probably some things happening, um, I want to make sure that if you have any questions that I can answer them all. So the basics under the public records law, and it really is pretty simple under the public records law. Um, we have a very broad statute, which applies to all kinds of records, including every kind of electronic record that you can possibly imagine. Uh, and in IT people, you can imagine electronic records that I don't even know exist, I'm sure. Um, and the basic law in North Carolina is that if you're a public agency, any record, again, electronic, any, any format, um, Media. Any record that the agency or anybody connected with the agency receives or makes is a public record as long as it relates to the transaction of the public business of the agency, unless there's an exception that says it's not. So anything connected with the business of the agency that is documented in some way that is made by or received by the unit of government is a public record. What does it mean that it's a public record? It means anybody, anywhere in the world, can ask, access it. The right of access is to come and inspect it or to have a copy of it. It's not limited to people who are citizens. It doesn't have to be somebody who's a resident of your jurisdiction. It really literally can be anybody, and that's, that's the right of access. And you may be familiar with the fact that there's very limited ability to charge people, to require them to put it in writing. It's a very, very broad right of access. There's a lot of... Um, the other thing that's in the materials that, that I'll make sure you get um, is a list of blog posts. The School of Government has a blog. It's called Coates Cannons. Um, it's called Coates Cannons because the gentleman who founded the Institute of Government, now the School of Government, was Albert Coates, and we named our blog after him. It's a law blog. We post short pieces answering legal questions that people have in North Carolina, um, and there are quite a number of them on public records issues, including a lot of digital records. Um, so I gave you a, a selection of those blog posts, and like I said, I'll make sure that you guys get access to that document. It's on, it's on the other side of the, um, the case problems. So that's the basic law. How many of you deal with public records requests in your work? Okay. Anybody had a particularly difficult one anytime recently? I'm not going to ask you to explain that. I'm just curious. Yeah. Are they all difficult? All right, well, let's talk about these cases, and I'll just go ahead and summarize them. Usually what I do is hand them out and let people talk about them, but you guys don't have to shout across your tables anymore. So um, the first question I, I have here is designed to be quite provocative. Here's the question. The best way, it's a statement really, and it's the question is whether it's true or false. The best way to manage emails for purposes of public records requests and retention is to capture and archive all the incoming emails in a centralized system in which they are preserved for a minimum 
of at least one year. So all the incoming. So the question is, true or false, the best way to deal with emails for purposes of records requests and retention to capture them all on the way. How many of you do that? Okay. What do you, <laughs> how many of you do that over the objection of your lawyer? <laughs> He's a lawyer, that's saying a lot. Okay, so so what are the advantages of doing that? It's easy. It's easy. Okay. Is that that's probably the main one, right? I think it's also it's taking things up because if they don't, then there's there's leakage as far as who, who gets rid of it. Right. So when you say it's easy, it's that it's not hard, and the thing that makes it hard is tracking down all of the emails that people may have, right? What are, so let me just ask you the question, how many of you think true that that, how many of you think it's true that that is the best way to do it? We use it for the year. Right. I mean, the state kind of it, it's really not, so, I'm, it's, it's not compliant. Right. That's compliant, it's for a year, so are you really asking about the incoming, or are you asking the formal Well, I'm just saying, you, you preserve them all for at least a year, then uh, let's assume that you would then go through and delete the ones you don't have to presume for long. Okay. Do something with them. Yeah, good point, good point. So, but at a minimum, you, you would keep them for a year. Say, <laughs> of course I was trying to trick you, no. Well, let's just, but let's just assume you do what you're supposed to do with retention. Okay. The main point is having them all there and having them there for a specific period of time, right? Yeah. Because some of those records you don't have to retain for more than a day. Right. But usually, if you're capturing them all, then you have sort of a universal sort of, and we're going to keep them all for some period of time, right? Right. Right. So how many of you think that is the best way to do it? Okay, how many of you think it's not? Okay, those of you who say it's not, we've heard from people about why it's a good idea. Why is it not a good idea? Anybody want to volunteer? So I want you to go to public records request for all this stuff. Somebody's got a sick. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll agree. That's, that's what's coming up. Uh, we've got several public records requests, and it turns into attorney's fees, um, you know, to go through and do that sort of. Um, right. So, and so there's a lot more to look through, correct. theoretically, than than you would have had if they were all over the place, and you just asked people. And then there's an assumption that we're now the custodian because we supply. Okay. So this is one of the legal issues that I wanted to raise with you. Um, so the, the public records law creates an obligation, the actual legal obligation is for the custodians of records to provide access to those records. Um, I will say that, and Shannon has taught me this, <laughs> um, just because you house those records in some big huge database somewhere, or it's not a database, but whatever you call it, what do you call it, a server or something, it's in a place that you are in charge of. I am obviously not the IT person at this world of government. Um, that doesn't make you the custodian of it. If you look at the definition in the statute of the, who the custodian of record is, it's the person who's basically responsible substantively for that record. It's the person in whose office or who's in charge of the office that the record relates to. And there's a provision in there that says something to the effect that um, somebody who warehouses the records um, is not the custodian of the records. So in the old days when we used to have you know, a big warehouse and there were literally files in there or there was a file room. The person who works in the file room is not the custodian any more so than the IT person is the custodian of all those records just because we capture them electronically and we store them all in this big electronic warehouse. So you're not literally legally the custodian, but as a practical matter, that request is somehow going to involve you because you're the person who has access to it. The most important thing, I think, for that, whether you capture them all on the way in or in whatever way that you have access to or some responsibility for those records, is to be clear for yourself and you may have to train your organizations to make sure they understand it's not your job to go through all of those and figure out which ones are going to be released and which ones aren't. And yes, it, is, it does turn into attorney's fees or whoever it is within the agency who has this, the, the sort of legal responsibility to make what is a legal decision about do we have to release this record or not. Um, so any questions about that? It's, 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 it may be convenient, 
But I think it's important for everybody to understand what an IT person's role is in that. It's not as a custodian, and it's not as a person who makes that call. If you take it back to the paper form and you do have a warehouse, what was the typical, was that, that it, those files delivered to the custodian for them to then go through and produce? Uh, or did it typically, I mean, or does that vary county to county? Or yeah, it's a good question. I don't, you know, I don't remember that far back. I wasn't doing this, I wasn't doing this work when people had mostly paper documents, but I would assume so. Either, you know, depending on the nature of the records, if they're permanent retention work records, but somebody probably comes to the warehouse and looks at them there, um, you have to have to be careful about that in terms of records going places. Obviously, if, if it's the requester that's asking, you might give them access directly to those records with supervision. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be, there would be a checkout system and you would, you know, you'd check them out and they would go through them and then they would return them. So, so it's not really any different, except it's easier. Now, I mean, the, the, there is a role for the IT person because, and, and this sort of leads into the whole e-discovery world, there's an art to figuring out how to search um, and that really becomes sort of a substantive skill. Um, if you get a question where it's, it's based on a request for certain kinds of records, somebody's got to figure out how to find those records, um, what kinds of searches to do, and, and there's litigation in the e-discovery world about, you know, are you doing that the right way? In the e-discovery world where you're in litigation, you have a legal obligation to get those records. You can be sanctioned for not doing a good enough search. It's not likely going to be as much of an issue with a public records request, but it could. So there is a, a, a skill that you bring to the table um, and should be done. I, I remember talking to um, a guy who works at the university who said, you know, the lawyers actually don't understand how to search the right way. They don't, it, so, you know, you, you need to be able to help them understand it if they're asking you to search in a way that's not going to get them what they need. So there, there is some value added there. Um, the biggest concern that I guess I have, well, I only got one answer on the downsides. We talked about the custodian issue. What about other issues of, of doing it that way? Other thoughts that people have? Yeah. The touch on what you discovered that the piece of the public record question get the opportunity to carve out things that aren't true public records or right. also request. But the larger the universe you have for discovery, the more smoking guns and financial materials hanging out there that you could have allowed by law to get rid of a long time ago. Right, so this is bringing up um, the issue of if you take it, if you capture it all on the way in, and especially if you save it for some period of time, even as a short a period of time, relatively speaking, as a year, you're going to be saving records that you don't legally need to save. Um, and and then, because you have them, you have this strange situation. So, uh, under the law, I'm the custodian of the records I create on my computer. If I delete, I'm very good at deleting records. I try to delete every record that I don't need. When you guys email me, I delete those things because they're not things I'm required to keep, and your question doesn't need to be about the record. So, even if I delete it, even if I delete, delete it, it's still housed on some university server somewhere. We don't have a case in North Carolina about what the status of that record is, but my guess is if somebody wants a copy of that record, now that I've made you feel good that I delete all your records, and I'm not going to make you realize that if it's still on the university server and we get a request, my guess is that a court would say, well, the university still has that record. I mean, it's this crazy thing. I'm the custodian. I'm the only person who really, in effect, has the ability to delete it, and I've done everything I can to delete it. It's like I've thrown away a piece of paper, but the university grabs that out of my garbage can, and puts it in a big warehouse someplace, and we still have it. And I think, you know, a court would say, probably, that because the university keeps that for a business reason, that it's still fair game. The point that Brandon was making, that includes not only things that the custodian has lawfully deleted, which the unit did not have an obligation to keep more than for its administrative value, which could be when I'm done using it. Um, but it also includes a whole category of records which are not public records because they don't relate to the public's business. So if I email my husband to remind him to pick up our daughter, because it's his turn this week, and I do that on my SOG account, that record is still going to be archived. It's not a public record. 
because it doesn't relate to the transaction of public business. And there's all kinds of really lascivious, juicy stuff that people put on their public email accounts that somebody digging, not under a public records request, because it wouldn't be eligible for access to public records, you wouldn't have any obligation to give it. But if there's litigation, somebody wants a smoking gun, even if it doesn't relate to the public's business, even if it's not a public record, in litigation, you still have created this treasure trove of stuff that in litigation you'd be required to talk about. So those are the downsides. The, 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 the answer is there's not really, as far as I know, and I'm sure if there was, you all would have figured it out, or Shannon would have figured it out, a really happy medium between those two things. So either capture it all off on the front end, and then you figure out how to get rid of the stuff you don't need, which is a hugely time consuming and probably not something that anybody who thinks capturing it on the, on the front side um, is going to be a good use of your time. Um, the, the other alternative is to have some system where people are responsible for archiving things or sending things. That's never going to be 100%, you know, fail safe. Um, or you have to chase things down when, when you get a request. Um, again, the good news is, unless it's a request for your records, you're not personally responsible for the fact that your board members have been making public records on their privately owned devices when you get a request. I mean, basically, I get this question all the time, what do we do? You know, our board member says they don't have them. Our board members say they don't think those are public, they're not going to give them up. You know, there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, it might be the attorney's problem, but only to defend the lawsuit that's not defensible. You know, it's not going to be your problem. Um, any thoughts or comments about where we are on this issue? Yeah. One thing, when I, when I said we email, we archive everything, what we actually did was 30 days, so giving people 30 days, representing the parties in that case, the process of discovery and litigation is you get to request records. The, the legal standard for records is, are those records likely to be relevant to the matter at hand? So whether they're public records or not, so let's say the person was fired because she was having an affair with somebody in another office and that violates the personnel problem, uh, policy. All of the records that they're exchanging although they would not be public records available to the public at large, would be relevant to that case and the lawyers could request access to them. Did I get that right? I don't do litigation. That's the basic difference. So in litigation, it's not that the public in general has access, but that the, the litigants, the parties to the case, can get the evidence that's relevant to the case. So, And because the parties, the system is set up so that the parties actually have a right to get them, if you destroy them, you can be sanctioned, um, even before they've been asked for. If there's anything, the, the sort of litigation hold concept is if there are records that you have that might be relevant to a potential lawsuit, you actually have an obligation to keep them. So it's good for that purpose, but then again, um, if you deleted them based on your ability under the public records law way before there was any ever any inkling that, that you would need them for litigation, that would be fair game. That's where we thought we were keeping on that because of litigation hall. I mean, we had no way before to say to right. stop that. So people could not right. do anything. We were thinking that's why we needed it. That well, you do, but again, the, the, the hard part is you don't have to keep everything and, and every, you know anything and everything, only the things that might 
lead up to a lawsuit, but you never know what that's going to lead to. So it's a hard, it's a hard standard, but but it's a trade-off. There's nothing in the law that requires you to keep absolutely everything, but it's harder if you have to pick and choose, because then you really have to make some hard decisions. So it's not an easy problem. I was going to say what seems to be difficult about that is when talking with other counties and municipalities, someone else has implemented a solution that captures all social media data, all of this, and then so a neighboring county may be doing way more than you know we're doing, and so it's like, well, why aren't you doing that as well? I mean, right. Been, so once you set that standard high, sure. then when you get into the litigation, they say, well, lots of counties do this, but you don't, so obviously you're not living up to your. Ooh, that's a hard. One. Not that I want to really say well, it's a uh, So somebody could win the billion dollar giga, you know, award for solving this problem. So I want to see you back here next year with your solution and your first prize money check. All right, that was the first question. <laughs> we only have uh, five more, so that's good. Okay, second question. Um, thank you. That was very um, educational for me. The IT department is legally responsible for maintaining and providing access to all electronic records, including those that may be created on private accounts or privately owned devices, true or false. I think we covered that, right? So it's not your responsibility. Um, again, your custodians in sort of the warehouse sense, so you are responsible for the public records that you create on your own devices, privately or publicly owned. Again, just to make clear, the law does not really care how the record was created, whether it's on a publicly owned or privately owned device, whether it's on a private uh, email account or Twitter or whatever it is. It's really all about the content of the record that determines whether it's a public record. So to the extent that you all are making records like all of us are from home or on, you know, texting on your phones, whatever it is, those are our public records. Many of them probably don't need to be retained, but to the extent that everybody else in the organization is doing that, it's not your legal responsibility unless you happen to be given that assignment other than your IT assignment. So that was kind of an easy one, and we talked about that one already. All right, so here's a fun one. Question number three says, at a recent board meeting, several city council members were seen texting during the meeting. Although each council member is provided a government-issued tablet for official use, the texting was taking place on their privately owned devices, and following the meeting, the council received a request for copies of all of the texts that were made or received by any council member during the meeting. Somebody was on the ball. Um, how would you categorize the following text messages which were sent or received by council members during the meeting in terms of whether they are public records or not? Okay, here's the first one. Mayor droning on again. Need to rule him out of order. Okay, that's the first one. Just think about that one. The next one is poker next week, my house. That's the second one. Third one is, don't know why Sherry is wasting her time on this. Doesn't she know we're all voting against it? You still in? The next one is, did you get the briefing slash talking points from the chamber on this? Apparently Sherry didn't. And the last one is, chamber weighing in now says we still have the votes we need. Are any of those public records, do you think? Okay, two of them, which ones? I thought four. Three and five. Three and five. All right, let's try Mayor droning on again. Need to rule him out of order. Public record? It's got the word mayor in it. It's also got a formal business procedure. Need to rule him out of order? You think they really, yeah? That's what Maybe? I was uh -huh. Out of order, yeah? How about poker next week, my house? Yeah, pretty, pretty much not, huh? How about, don't know why Sherry is wasting her time on this, doesn't she know we're all voting against it? You still in. You think that's a public record? I don't know whether you still in is referring to the poker or 
That was an intentional. You didn't tell us who to and from. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> this is where you need a PowerPoint so you can see who's texting who. Um, how about the, did you get the briefing t talking points uh, from the chamber on this? Okay, all right, and then chamber weighing in says we still have the votes we need. It's pretty hard though, isn't it? So here's my, my legal conundrum of late is, does popping off about public business constitute a public record or not? You know, I mean, if you're just, you know, expressing your frustration about the mayor, is that a public record or is that just popping off? I tend to think it's not, but of course, that's going to be the juiciest stuff, you know, that people want to have. Um, the point of all this, I, I think any time you say something that relates to the vote that's pending, I think that's going to be a public record. I'm not sure about the out of order. I think that was just a way of saying we want the mayor to shut up. But, you know, if what we're saying is we would really wish the mayor would shut up, I don't know if that's a public record or not. Um, so, point, couple of points about this. It is quite possible that even within a meeting on their private devices, they could legally be creating records that are public records. Um, I wrote a blog post about this, and then uh, again, it's on the list of, of posts that I'll, I'll make sure you get. Um, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing illegal about texting during a meeting in and of itself. Um, before we had texting. That one-way communication that has them all listed on is fine, 
The problem is when they, if they start reacting to that email, a majority of them, either back and forth with each other or back and forth with the manager as if they're sort of having a discussion. We don't have a case on that yet in North Carolina, but I think that's what it would take. And I was at a national meeting where they were saying the thing to do is to email them and blind copy um, all of the board members so that they won't just hit reply all and, and, and then, but then, you know, then you have the metadata and you know, somebody could get that information and so I, I don't really quite understand that advice. I think you just have to train them not to engage a majority of them on some electronic device that's keeping a record of it. <laughs> to ask a, a different question on yeah. that situation. Yeah. Suppose that request doesn't come in for another week or so and we know the cell carriers now don't keep right. that data right. for it's gone. Unless so, it's still on their device. Right. So first of all, probably if any of these things, well, I won't say probably, if any of these things are a public record that I just gave, none of them are things you'd have to retain. Um, Karen Melanzi, um, who does a lot of work with ePublic Records and eDiscovery, did a blog post using texts where she gave an example of somebody texting a complaint. Well, under the records retention uh, schedule, you have an obligation to retain complaints. Um, they, the folks there have suggested that may not need to retain the, the, the tweet or the Facebook posting once you've actually responded to it, but that's a little unclear. So you might have things in there that you have to retain somehow, but most of the time, texts and tweets are gonna be things that are of short-term value. If they disappear into the carrier's records, if they're, not, if they're still on your phone, and somebody asks for them, they're there. If, they, if, if you don't have custody of them anymore, you don't have them anywhere, and you've done whatever you want to do to delete them or not save them, I don't think you have a problem. You, you've deleted them, and, and you don't have any obligation to provide them. But if they're still there, then they do. You see, our members are a member of communication. Right. Yeah, and, and you should look at you should look at um, her blog post about that because once it's no longer on a device and it's in your service provider's hands, it can be very difficult under federal law to get it. And we don't have a case in North Carolina about what our obligation is in that situation. We have to go to, I mean, the person who made or received the, the text can give permission and should give permission um, I think Kara's advice is that um, if you have at least official accounts um, that people are using, you should require them to say as part of their contract with the city or the county that they will agree to request access if it, if it comes to that. But you may have to get a court order. So it's complicated. Yeah. I have a question about Twitter. Though. Or, and I've had this argument with my PIO. Because a public record either has to be received or created. I don't think you receive tweets. Tweets, uh, to me, the, the tweets are like somebody standing in the public square and yelling. You may hear them or hear them not. Twitter well, is, it, Twitter is an but, aggregator. It's not like email. Yeah, but, but, but let, me, email. Let, me, let me, I always like to try and do an analogy to something I can understand that's, that's you know, not electric, acoustic. Um, so, if you own a telephone pole and somebody staples a flyer on it, are you responsible for that record? Well, I don't think Twitter's like that because they're not posting that tweet on your telephone pole. Well, but you created the site. No, not even with the Twitter. Not. Well, I, I, guess, I guess that would be true in a Facebook. Yeah. Facebook, yes, Facebook, but Twitter's yes. different. But you, Twitter but is you, just when you don't you create the site when you when you say follow us on Twitter? No, it's, it's more like a, if, if I tweet out something from our Twitter account, that, that is a record, I'm generating right. that. Right. But when somebody tweets back, I'm not actually receiving that record. Yeah, I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's an argument that a court would accept in that sense. I mean, I think what it means to receive something, I mean, I could make the argument that if I receive a Gmail, you know, to my account, I don't, I'm not receiving that. I but don't you, have it. It's somewhere but, in the cloud. Well, I, I still think, because you do have a receipt of that. It's coming into an account you own. When you look at somebody else's tweet, 
you're not taking that into your account. It's no different than if you had some news aggregator app that aggregates articles from CNN and stuff, and you go view that on your aggregator, you're not receiving those news articles. You don't have to keep them as records. But are you saying that you're tweeting back to, I mean, I'm trying to get on the technical aspect, to the app of the account? Like if you if the county owns an it's account, and you're, 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 you know, because it actually does show you now that it's a conversation. Now, if you, I, I don't know, I guess that's where you get into is if you put the hashtag, you know, if somebody com tweeted a complaint and said, you know, hashtag fail, I don't like the roads in such and such, and right. they didn't put an at symbol, they would be complaining. But if they put at rolling But even if they put at, you're not actually receiving that in your Twitter account. Your Twitter account doesn't receive that. You're just aggregating that in your view. There, no, no, no. If a, I'm a judge and I reference. see your, your, your county web page and here's tweet. all the tweets that people have posted. Yeah, it's considered a direct tweet. I would it's, think it's directional. If it has the app, I would say that that was addressed to you. So yeah. the judge would probably interpret yeah. that as being sent. I'm just saying, saying a judge is not going to have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and a judge is going to look at the front page of your website and see all these posts on there and say, you got those. They're on your website. It doesn't really matter where they really are. You're, you're inviting people to do that. And I think there's a custodian question there, too. The custodian would be if you have, let's say, council members communicating with each other on their private Twitter accounts that they use for council business. I think at the end of the day, what a court's going to rule is you can argue the technical side at the end of the day is they're going to look at what is this the functional equivalent of. And they're going to look at this is they're communicating with each other in the same way they would via text, in the same way they would via an email, or if they were in the same room, the same way that they would via words as recorded. That's exactly right. And, and, and um, I'm going to have to split my honorarium with you. Um, it's going to be hard to split them. I think that the way, uh, one of the things I often say when we talk about e-public records is that the law has just simply not kept up with the technology. I mean, we don't even know at this point whether the public records law obligates us to provide access to metadata, and if so, at what level? D don't even know that. So this is like way beyond that question. But I think that to the extent that people are doing the public's business using these technologies, that a court is going to be very unlikely to say, yep, you've outsmarted us, you are doing the public's business, but technically it's not received. I think, I think that they will be looking at, you know, is this really doing the public's business or not? And if it is, I think they're going to find a way to say that it's something that you may have received. So I'm, it's an interesting argument. Um, you know, when Kara first started to try and get the city and county attorneys to think about cloud contracts, uh, there were a number of them that said, well, you know, if, if we don't have it, we, you know, it's not, we're not responsible for providing access to it. You know, the idea was all of these records are going to be in the cloud, we don't have them anymore. And I think that's crazy. I think the court will say that's no different from saying we put up, a, we, we outsourced it to a warehouse down the street, we don't have the key, so we don't, you know, we have to ask that provider to get it for us, we don't have any obligation to do that. No, I think the court is going to say you do. So it's um, even though the statute hasn't kept up with the law, I think courts will be looking for um, or will, will shy away from saying if this really feels like it's a transaction of public business, we're not going to use a technical reason to say a person doesn't have access. Apart from the fact that it's not entirely clear how you would get access to that. Um, after, you know, I mean, but but yet yeah, phone conversations aren't. But they never happen. But I guess my point is, is there's a generational difference now. Yep. There are right. people now who will send you a text before they will call you. That's exactly right. My kids are terrible about right. it. They'll send me right. 15 texts. I'm like, pick up the phone and call. Right. But what I've said is, you know, we, we have always record. been doing all of these things. It's just now that we document them in all these ways. <coughs> and I don't think the court is going to say, oh, well, this used to be something we do by a phone call, so you don't have to produce the record. But a recorded phone call can be a yes, a, a voicemail so, message. So text is basically a recorded conversation, just like a recorded phone call. Yeah, yeah but some people say things in text that they just shouldn't. <laughs> so what you're saying is that we should stop Twitter, Facebook, everything, and just go back to Canary Pigeon. 
Well, I have to say, I don't do any of those things, and my carrier pigeon is working really, really well, so, but, no. Um, I, no, I, you know, I think that education, I will say that I give this speech to the elect, elected officials, and they are getting it. I mean, not that it changes their behavior particularly, but they do understand that all this stuff that they create on their own private uh, devices is public. So I think the message is getting out. Um, that's, that's all I can say. Yeah. I think one of the hardest issues dealing with the convergence of the technology and the law is the desire from an IT perspective to implement as fast as possible things that the enterprise wants to see. And there needs to be a moment where you hit the pause button and figure out what new records is this creating and how are we going to address the first requests we start getting about them. Because in Raleigh we're considering rolling out unified messaging and People don't ask us for voicemails on phones or on our PBX servers. They just haven't because they figure we don't know how to get them or right. can't get them. But, now they're all but they do ask for email attachments right. routinely. And the moment you take that voicemail and you put it in an email yeah. attachment, they're not searchable. And the only record that we had in our system was a message from this phone number was delivered to you on this date. And it's now it's a way file in their email. So the question I asked our IT infrastructure manager was, how are you going to respond to the request when you start getting broad public record requests and your only identifier is the phone number that you want to take? And there was no answer. Somebody's going to have to sit down and listen to all of those. Yeah. Well, no, so like, nobody wanted to do that, so they pulled the plug. The person who receives that voicemail needs to make a decision at that point whether it's a public record or not. And they, you need to have a way for them to say that. Right. Or to some identifiers on it. This is a message about the new convention center and the hard right. budget. And you know, that's, that's a perfect, perfect, perfect segue because to me, I think, as email comes in, it would be really nice if you could categorize it immediately from reading it and say whether it's financial or whatever, so then some rule could be applied to it once it got tagged. Right. I think Shannon, was it Raleigh that she worked with? So was, you, somebody tried to do that Durham to set hard. up a system where that it would sort of automatically well, or well, that you could... At the university, we had tried to force by creating a folder. We created a seven-year folder, a five-year folder, yeah. a three-year folder. And that's what records retention tells you to do. And try to tell everybody to start yep. dragging in. And it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Because nobody ever did it. Mm -hmm. And then you had to archive that year. And then you had to go back later and say, okay, three years. And you go back through and delete. So they went to a It's very hard. You won't get everything. But everything. it's probably better than nothing. New Hanover, I think, um, does something where they ask people to designate it as personal or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of confusing, I think. And one of the interesting questions is, um, is that is to say, not a public record, you know, things that just not are, are personal, not personnel, but personal. Um, but then I had the press call me, um, and just so you know, the press does call me, <laughs> and I answer questions for them, um, and said, well, what if we don't believe them? I mean, I mean you could just mark anything as per personal that's controversial. And it's just sort of like, well, at a certain point, you just have to trust people. You've got the same thing as a public yeah. issue. I, I just delight, you can just delete it, yeah. Yeah. And it's up to them to determine whether it's city business or not. That's right. We've got, we've got a couple of them. One of them would basically say, look, just yeah. come download my whole my whole yeah. stuff. Right. And then let city lawyer attorney figure it out. Right. But he runs a finance company, so it's a it's a SOX compliance thing. Oh yeah, we do absolutely that. don't want to have all those records. Well, and the other thing is sometimes people will say, Well, I don't have that record, I don't have that email. And then the press or whoever's asking for it will say, Well, I have it. Because right. I have it from the other end. I have it from the person he sent it to. Well, and they think that I've got you. Well, you know, the person might have deleted it. And it's probably something they had a right to delete. So it's not as much of a gotcha as people think it is. But, you know, a lot of times people say, well, that, I don't have anything. So <coughs> there's not really anything you can do about that. With the archival thing, um, what we did was, I'm not saying it's going to work, but we did in our policy say that the individual was a custodian, not IT, but that we were keeping it for five years. If anything that needs from the public records retention for longer than five years, it was up to them to print it and to keep it. So, at least on paper, you know, we said, I don't think it's going to happen, but, you know. Let's well, and with emails, um, there is a risk of printing as a way of, of um, retaining records because of the metadata is lost. So, and we don't, again, we don't know, we don't have anything in North Carolina yet that says whether you have to preserve electronic records electronically or the extent to which you have to preserve the metadata. But there is a, the one case that we know about from Washington 
is a case where a person made a request and what they wanted was the email address of the person who sent the email, which they ended up requiring that person to do forensics to find in their computer because it had not been retained. So you, you may miss some of what you're required to give. But otherwise, it's better than nothing. Forever. That's right. You don't want to set up your system for a Right. Okay. Let me just cover um, a couple of the last two questions. You guys have been great. Um, a candidate for mayor asks for the names, addresses, email addresses, and telephone numbers of all the current members of the city's appointed boards. How many of you have that information, maybe in a database or in some sort of record? Is that public record? Names, addresses, telephone numbers, and email addresses. Quick answer, yes, it is. You have that record because it's part of the transaction of public business. Those people are private citizens, but they are on your boards, and you keep that information. They're not employees, so you can't argue that it's in the personnel file. So that is information that is public. Um, there is a, one, there's, there's nothing in the public records law that makes emails confidential, email addresses. So another, the, the second part of the question is copies of emails relating to city matters from members of the public to current members of the city council within the past year, including the metadata, including their email addresses. So emails that your board members or staff receive, theoretically the email addresses of those emails are public record. I mean, that could be considered metadata. There's nothing in the statute that addresses that. So if somebody specifically asks for that information, you probably have an obligation to provide it. Um, and the third is uh, the email addresses of all those who've subscribed to the city's e-newsletter. Now, based on the first things that I said, you would think you'd have to provide that information. But the legislature created one exception for emails that says if you have an email subscription list, the email addresses in that email subscription list that you have doesn't say they're not public records. It says you don't have an obligation to provide them with a copy. This was in a response to a specific set of situations where people were asking for downloads of all these email addresses so they could use them commercially or spam them, whatever. So the, the legislature, instead of dealing with the whole email question, they carve out this weird little exception that only applies to local government email subscription lists. So my argument is, if you have a database that just has all the emails of your board members, or if it's a one-off email from a citizen, that stuff is public. But the email subscription list, they don't have a right to download. And that's just the way the law is right now. If you have, because we've run into it, and you can talk with you if they ask about this, uh, if you have an internal distribution list uh, that's created, think from an IP perspective, an exchange distribution list uh, that shows up on an email. So in the metadata, it would only show up as, you know. SOG recruitment committee. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. We have dozens of those. Okay. So in, in yeah. that case, would that expanding that list for the benefit of the public record request, especially with that particular um, provision that you just mentioned there. Well, the email like subscription list I think would not apply to that because that's an internal email list. Uh, um, they haven't subscribed to that was actually that's created. Right. And I think the subscription list is really talking about private emails where they've subscribed to receive information from the unit. I, and I, I did make an argument in my blog post about this that if you had a if you're if the only emails you had of your appointed boards. If that was where you would ask them to give you your email so you could notify them, you could maybe argue that that's a subscription list. But an internal list, that's just going to be a metadata question. So the question is, if you provide it to them and it says SOG Recruitment Committee and they say, I want you to open that up, um, all of those individual emails are going to be public records. But it could be significant in terms of who this, the email got sent to, smoking gun issue. I imagine a court would probably say you have to provide it. Last question, the citizen has requested copies of the manager's budget presentation, um, PowerPoint presentation, in native format. The manager wants you to give it to them in the PDF version because they don't want anybody to modify it. The question is, can you legally provide it in PDF if they've asked for it in native format? He said no. He 
He's right. Why? We can't fix it what form that is. That's right. Um, you, the, uh, the way the statute reads is that you have to give it, and there's, there, I actually wrote a blog post with lots of help from Shannon, distinguishing between format and medium. This is, this is how you become an academic, right? You spend time writing about the difference between format and medium. What the statute says is that you have to give it to them in the medium in which they request it if you have the capacity to do that. I think that means paper or electronic. I don't think you have to give it to them in a particular format if you don't have it in that format, right? So I don't think that the medium language allows them to say, I want this spreadsheet, but I want you to format it differently, or I want you to create a new spreadsheet, or something like that. However, the basic law under the public records law is you have to give them the document you have. If you have a PowerPoint, that is in native format, I don't think you have the right to say, I'm not going to give you that record. I'm going to give it to you in a PDF, which is a different record. So on some level, it's, you're not actually giving them the record that they, that they want. And the whole idea that you want to give it to them that way because you, don't, you want to control what they do with it, you just got to forget about that because you have no right to control what they do with the record that they have. So I have a question on that. Yeah. Uh, it seems to come up with our different department directors. Uh, and this is just to handle traditional request is electronic, especially now being able to put something out and say, here's a link, you go download it. That way you can deal with any file sizes versus we need to burn CDs all the time. Uh, you know, because that just turns That's into a great a question, and I don't know the answer to it. So that must be we're at the end of the show. Because now you're starting to ask me questions I don't know the answer to. I actually know you've heard me. Yeah, I, it's a really good question because more and more there's stuff. I mean, so you could just point, you know, go, that information's on the GIS system. You know, yeah. is that enough? Right. I, I, that's where I would start, frankly. At least you could give it a shot. I'd give it a shot. Out. You know, I saw one case from another state that said it was okay to do that, that that was sufficient. I've seen other cases, like somebody wants a copy of an ordinance and you send them to Municode, but you can't to, sometimes you have to join Municode to get that down, so, but it seems to me if it's free online and downloadable, you know, unless somebody says, you know, I'm 100 years old, I don't know how to use a computer, um, or I'm my age and I don't know how to use a computer, um, maybe you help people out. When I, when I have this conversation with PIOs, they say, well, why would we do that? I mean, we want to provide people with information. This is what we're about. So it may depend on which office you're in, how you respond to that question. But legally, I don't know the answer. It well, seems to me that if it's available. They can't ask us to put it in the format of which we have no mechanism of putting in that format, correct? That's right. But if you have it, and you can download it to a CD or email it to yeah, them that, or something I mean, like that. Is everybody that <coughs> satisfies the releases? Some guy may, we may have exchanged, some other guy may have group wise, and he gets in the group wise from that, we can't give it to him. Right, that, that's, that's right. And that's, that's the difference, in my, in my view, the difference between medium and format. But the point I'm making about the whole PDF thing is, and it's fine as a, as a general rule to give people stuff in PDF, but if they insist on having it in native format, and you have it in native format, which you obviously do, I don't think you can say, no, we don't want you to have it like that because we don't want, we don't want you to use it for some reason that we don't approve of. Um, I'll leave you with, on that question, in terms of the software, the next, the next frontier on this, um, and there's an interesting case of California, is um, there are now records that we create that can't really be used without having the underlying software that makes it useful. Um, this is an issue with GIS. And, there's, and there is a case out of California where they did this incredibly detailed and tortured analysis where they basically, and the, and the, the organization that was requesting the record said, I can't use this record in the way that it was designed to be used without having basically the software that comes with it. And the court said that's right. So the, the issue that, I mean, up until this point, we've assumed you don't have to, you don't have to reprogram it and you don't have to cough up your software. Uh, maybe changing with the way certain kinds of records that we're creating are only useful with the software that runs them. So I don't know how, where we would be on that, but maybe next year we'll be talking about that. Somebody who actually understands all this stuff will have to do it. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for coming. It was fun. And uh, if you have any questions, ask Brent. Thank you. <laughs>